the uh, so I published this article uh, called "An Integrated Approach to Playing Saxophone," published in the Saxophone Symposium, which is the professional journal for saxophone uh, players, professors, and um, it was very controversial. Um, I was invited to write it, but it was so controversial because they there was a huge fight within the organization whether they wanted to have that, and uh, because it was very classical oriented, and um, I don't want to get into all that, but it's it's the the entire way of teaching was very conservatory uh, approach, even in saxophone. You'd be surprised that people would actually take lessons in saxophone, get degrees, and not be able to play any jazz at all, even though it's a dominant artistic and professional standard. But that's because that's the education system was more toward a, a ceremonial band or you know a high school band, and so. I figured this out and and of course years before publishing it and that was in 88 that is in my uh, saxophone um, uh, website called saxcoach.org and you can read that article that article was published in 88 1988 and so i thought okay that's great that's a big project huge uh now let's go on and my students will know what to do uh but it didn't turn out to be that simple because my students couldn't figure it out now I figured I had already figured this out by '83, um, and they could not do it. Um, and these were really talented students in Illinois. And Chicago is a huge talent pool, and we were getting a, our our lion's share of those students, even though it was a small class. Um, but they they struggled with it. And within an academic setting, a school setting, you have concert bands and so you have concerts and you have performances juries and all kinds of things where the students have to perform and since we were multi-genre particularly they had to be uh, versed right away in classical playing they came in as jazz players and they could not learn the classical styles and i had no idea why why can't you learn this i can do this if i can do this you can do this and it was very frustrating because it would take them an extraordinary long extraordinarily long time to figure out simple techniques like how to do an attack how to, how to start a note, it would always come out like jazz. And uh, so I started looking around at pedagogies and um, one of my colleagues, uh, Ron Price, who was the head of music education, was also in specialized in special education. His work there was groundbreaking. Uh, you might have even heard of like healing harps or that sort of thing. That was his creation. And so he said, well, this is this Feldenkrais method and you know one of his students gave him a book maybe you could check this out maybe this would be something you'd be interested in getting. and i read this book it was called the elusive obvious by moshe feldenkrais and he um it seemed like he was sitting in on my lessons it was so relevant to what i was struggling with as a teacher i said i have to learn more about this and this is before internet and so that was a real challenge um, because it wasn't something you could just go to the library and find. Um, but I did uh, find things. And uh, at that time, I was also suffering from a lot of pain in my back from playing. I was in my late 20s. And I knew that this was a, a dangerous thing because it could um, really interfere with my career. I wasn't a tenured professor. And so I was really concerned about it. Uh, and so I started doing this uh, movement lesson book, Awareness to Movement, in that book is a little fold out, um, a little fold out uh, lesson, the wood figure. And all the pain in my back went away. And I was, I was at a point where I was seeing a chiropractor every day before a performance and practicing with ice packs on my back to get through practice. It was a very, very painful situation. And uh, it instantly vanished. And, and I'm looking at this uh, situation with my studio, I said, this guy's really figured out something fundamental. I didn't understand how it would apply, but I knew it would apply. And so um, I was able to get the backing of the university to become trained in the Feldenkrais method and start what uh, became the first Feldenkrais class for musicians in the country. Uh, and um, so the issue that has came up from that it eventually became clear was that 
not only do you have a jazz technique that no one really understood how could you have a jazz technique since it was a feel. So if you played classical music and you were a jazz player, unconvincingly, you had a technical deficiency. But if you played jazz unconvincingly as a classical player, you had a conceptual uh, deficiency. You didn't understand the feel. But it was never viewed as technique. In fact, uh, classical music at that time was still referred to as serious music or legitimate music, not jazz. And um, so there wasn't even in the mindset that this could be something that would be a technique. And as it turned out, for quite a few players, it was very threatened by that idea because classical was no longer the standard technique and jazz was kind of an anomaly of that. And so, okay, we got that figured out, but then how do people learn it? And uh, I grew up from the beginning, since I was five, always immersed in classical and jazz. So for me, it was never a big deal. I went through college and I continued doing that. So when I got to be teaching in college, I didn't understand why people couldn't understand to do that. And it's very difficult to observe yourself on, you know, how did you learn to do it? Because you were five years old. How do you know what you learned when you're five? So, uh, so this seemed to really uh, apply. And what it really came down to, and Feldenkrais Methods is used for many things, uh, and I've taught it in many different settings, um, but it really came down to uh, these really dominant habits. And style, is, when you think about it, style really is one of the most dominant habits because every time you pick up your instrument, you're going to play in that style. So that is always being reinforced to the point it's compulsive. You won't play it any other way. And this explained why with Don Senti said, why do I sound like I'm playing Looney Tunes? It's because he was using techniques that were so familiar, that were so dominant, that that is the way he would play. And when you apply it to class, to jazz playing, it doesn't sound right. Uh, I could demonstrate that for you here, uh, uh, but I didn't put my horn together, but I could do that on top of And so, uh, so uh, and I haven't played this morning. <laughs> It's the seven o'clock here. So, um, so at any rate, so now I had to figure out a way, well, how do I bring the student, how do I bring someone that comes to me that wants to play saxophone and expand what they're doing? How do I do that in a way that, that makes sense to them? How do I do this that, that, um, that they can go beyond their habit? And, because our attitude is, if you have a habit, that you break the habit. And uh, I, I articulate all this, by the way, on my uh, website, saxcoach.org. And I'm going to screen share here so we can go there and I'll show you what that's about. And this is it. And uh, and it's, it's how to learn how to play saxophone and improvise. And um, on this, uh, you can scroll down, you have different areas here under practice. Uh, I'll pull that up. It has these videos, habitual playing. These are four videos that I recently made on this subject of how do you uh, go beyond your habits. And so what I've been doing the past year and a half or two years is developing this website so people could learn saxophone um, without necessarily having to have instruction. This is a free uh, uh, website, so anyone can uh, see it and learn from it. So, um, so that's what um, I'll talk about in the first part of this, is how do we, uh, I'm gonna go to my notes, or forgive me, how do we, let's see, um, yeah, how do we change, realize, and change a dominant habit? And so uh, now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because I don't want you to read my notes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the first thing that is the people uh, in, in general, people learn or change because they feel they need to change. Uh, there's no way to convince a person that doesn't feel they need to change that they need to change. <laughs> Why should they believe you? So, uh, and so 
in a way, the students are in a situation where they're expecting to change. They are expecting to learn things. So that's so much easier to teach someone that comes in that says, I expect to learn this. But they may not necessarily want to learn to play classical music. And so you can get into various things that they're playing. Uh, they have ensemble editions, they have performances they have to do before the peers. Maybe they're having trouble with pitches and the extreme ranges. And so uh, I could create a simple task, record them, ask them what they're not happy with. So there's all these ways to tune them into what do you need to really address here? And so, and then to provide some way that's going to convince them very quickly, you can fix this, you can address this. This is not beyond your reach. And so um, uh, one way that uh, I do this is, um, that uses from Feldenkrais is that we have ways that we do things that are that everybody does, like breathing. There's the the breath you use in, in music isn't a lot different than the breath you use in daily life. But if you play music, you could interfere with that. That may not be working like you or be serving you. Uh, for example, if you all want to try this, uh, take a large, everyone just take a very large breath and now go boom and you'll let it go, okay? Take a large breath, hold it, let it go, let it go. How long did it take you to let go a full breath of air? Did it take one second? Was it, was it a split second? If it took longer than that split second, you are restricting your breath. And that is a habit. You're actually not realizing it. You're holding something. So the, how do you how do you show someone that you, you've got a habit that you do here? You're doing something that you're compulsively doing and you're not thinking about it. Um, and so, uh, and I, I'm getting a lot of people here are uh, psychologists and I don't sure what everyone does, but I'm, we don't have time, I guess, for you all to introduce yourself to me. But uh, so, so, I would, I would have to go, so here is something, that would be the very first thing I would look at. Saying, look, if you're playing and you're restricting your breath, then whatever you do is going to be effortful. So whatever you're trying to learn is going to be difficult. And so it doesn't take long. Lower your shoulders. You let it go, it goes out instantly. And so I would talk to them about showing them, look, you have this issue here. And look, you do that through the instrument. And so if you were to ask someone, uh, for example, to play a saxophone, I'm going to demonstrate. That. And you would say, is a jazz player. He says, I want you to do a breath attack on beat one. I'm going to count it off and you're going to play a breath attack. This will take a mere second. One thing I didn't get ready. Oh my gosh. So these are the first sounds of the day. And they're going to be a little bit loud, I think. So I'm going to back up. So I say, do a breath attack. I'll beat one. And the jazz student will sound something like this. <laughs> well, first thing I'll tell him to do is put his neck strap on right. I'll go one, two, three, four. I'll go like this. He'll make that sound. He'll have a breath before he'll go fa. And I'll point out, I said, well, why don't you get rid of that breath? Because uh, that's not necessary. And uh, I'll count it off again. He'll go like this. Two, three, two, three. I'll put the breath before the sound. I said, wait a minute, you know, do that again. Get that thing straightened out. Can you do this? It's a simple thing. And he'll do it 10 times, 20 times, cannot do it. So then we talk about that. We break it down and say, well, wh why are you doing it? You go to a classical player, they'll do this. They will not put a breath before the tech. And that's the fundamental difference between classical and jazz. 
is that the temporal relationship, the timing of the breath and the sound. And that's part of the style that that person will do every time they play. And so it's a very strong habit. And so it's highly unlikely that student would be able to take that air out. And so there are ways that I would approach that to say, look, you know, you're making, you have a habit here. Let's see if you're making some false assumptions about how you're playing. And so um, I'll ask them, I said, you, do you think you, how do you, when you play, do you accelerate the air? Because that's what that sound is. It's and they will always say, of course, you have to accelerate the air. And so, it, so then I'll go back to the breath that you just experienced. And I say, well, we've got that down to like a quarter second, full breath of air. And let's see how long it takes you to play the loudest sound you can play. And let's count the number of seconds it takes for you to do that. And, and they'll do something like this. It might go on for seven or 10 seconds. So I said, so clearly your air is going slower than when you just release a breath. The air is moving much faster, even though you're not accelerating, you're not blowing it. Even if through the horn, it goes through in a second. It's a small aperture, so it'll go through slower than just releasing the mouth. And that little realization right there, that you do not accelerate the air to produce a tone because the air is slower. It goes through slower. Then if that's true, and we just demonstrated that's true, then how do you produce a tone? It's not through the acceleration. Now, what happens from that is now the student is asking themselves, the musician, because I have a num lot of professionals that study with me, uh, well, I don't know. I don't know what does that. So at first they really were convinced, this is how I do this. Now, you can't get rid of the air. You're holding your breath back. Now you realize, wow, well, what produces the air? Well, after some time, they realize that something happens in their throat to do that. And um, because there's no sensation there, it's really hard to talk about. So I call it the throat thingy. Now their throat thingy has to engage. But actually, there is something very specific on a website. You can see this, actually. Uh, Steve Jordheim at uh, Lawrence Conservatory up in Wisconsin uh, actually did this extensive study of endoscopic recording of the larynx of a saxophone player producing a sound. So they fed it through the nose and down into the throat and videoed the saxophone player when they play. And what happened, what they find, and you can go on and just type in your Google, saxophonist anatomy. The vocal folds, they come together. That is what helps make a saxophone reed vibrate. And so no one knew it because we could never feel it. And well, I don't get too much in the technical thing because you don't, I didn't you need to, they just need to get the result. Uh, and so um, now let's address that. Let's see if we can differentiate what goes on. So I would just create a little exercises. I never taught out of an exercise book. I always was looking at what they were doing. Okay, well, maybe you can do that. Maybe you, here's the, oh, you can't do that. Maybe you just have a pitch problem or something. We'll work on different ways. Uh, when, so a typical thing I call aerotone game. I like the word game as opposed to exercise because games are fun and exercises are a drag. And so it'd be one, two, three, you're on, you're gonna go, you're gonna start it on one. So there you go. They would do that. Sometimes they would fudge around with it. They didn't understand. Sometimes they would go and they pump it because they always associate habitually that it's accelerating. And so what happened? Uh, eventually they could get it so they can go on my cue. So we turned that into a game. So we're going to go one, two, then we go 
one and two and one and two and pfa on eighth notes. Then sixteenths, jeka 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 pfa. Then thirty seconds, jeli 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 pfa. Now right on it, ah. Uh. And within a period of ten minutes, usually ten minutes, they now can coordinate the air and the tone at the same time. Before, it could take them a year to figure that out. And so once we tapped into what your body actually does, what do you, what do, you do, and how do you become aware of what that is happening, then suddenly everything becomes easy. And I call it the ruby shoes, as that um, music is created by humans for humans. So you're already wearing the ruby shoes. And by the way, do you, I don't know if you read the news, but they, the guy that stole the ruby shoes, the original ruby shoes, confessed last week. I don't know if you saw that story. Yeah, they've got the ruby shoes back and they got the guy that stole the ruby shoes. So, so good. That where would we be without the ruby shoes? So, uh, so at any rate, um, when people this learning it wasn't through like in Feldenkrais method awareness through movement there's a very strong assumption of some teachers is that everything is about the movement but that's not how Moshe really taught everything he did it was one uh, functional integration are you all familiar with the method with awareness through movement? well there's this hands-on application called functional integration and then, then there's a verbal instruction like in a class that's called awareness through movement. This is one lesson that in the book called The Case of Nora, that he, this woman had a, a, a really a severe stroke and she lost her ability to count numbers, read. And so he was, had her on the table and he was drawing lines all over her, lines. And she says, what is that that you're, you're doing? He says, well, tell me, what am I doing? He says, you're drawing the number one. And it was that moment that she realized how to re-realize the meaning of numbers. And, but it wasn't through movement. It was through these, this tactile thing of number ones on her. And so some things are learned from movement. Some things are learned from just logic, from our saying, okay, that doesn't make sense. I have a different assumption here. Some things are just, from an image, I had a student that was a jazz player, not a very good classical player, but he had senior recital, he had to classical, I was really worried about it. So he was doing a project for me with Finale, which is this music notation. Back then it was very slow and cumbersome. And it took him all summer to do it. It was very arduous, very, very painstaking work. And uh, he was doing this notation program for me. And when he came to his lesson, uh, all of a sudden his classical playing was much better. And I say, have you been practicing classical? He said, no, because he didn't want to practice classical music. But his classical playing was better. And by the second week, I asked him, I said, what do you think is different? And he says, well, I look at the score and I, I look at the decrescendo and it starts here and it ends here. So that's what I do. And from that, his playing took a quantum leap that he became the runner up in the concerto competition. That semester was an unheard of. If you were to go to a, a teacher and say a person learned how to play classical music by doing some notation program on his computer, they would say, you're crazy, you can't learn to play classical music like that. But he did. And so uh, so we, we don't really understand how we learn things. And so we have so many assumptions about that. So um, I guess what I'm saying is that when I'm teaching, I, I really don't want to use an exercise book because it's, it's only going to really address a certain percentage of the students. It's not going to address the rest of them. So that's, um, that's in a uh, kind of a, how I approached developing, as I developed then these kinds of exercises that help people become aware of what they do. And that's posted on my, my website. Oh, I've got a screen share, so I can go to my, I'm just, Let's see, there you go. So we have these different categories and you can go through all these things of breath, technique, reads. These are topics that I just talk about. So it does help these people. And so all of these are going to have things about them that will 
address how to develop tone and it will consider these things that of how do you realize how you're limiting what you're doing and that's a really tricky thing to do because of our assumptions of how you practice learning music um, and so um, then the other part of this which was then even more challenging because every time you find some solution to something something else props up to this oh my god i have to do this other stuff um is how do you develop um a way that avoids how how do you create a let's say a method that avoids compulsive technique and that um, was something that I was is more difficult than to say, okay, this is what you do, and this is how you realize how to get around that and how to go beyond that. Um, how do you avoid it to begin with? And so um, that's what I've been specifically working on uh, the past 10 or 12 years, and in improvisation specifically. And my approach to doing that is by, and I don't really have this all up at my website yet, is to look at things like jazz improvisation. And that's to say, as opposed to like all the music I've done in computer music, which I've done a lot of, or classical music or new music, all of the stuff is this thing, the music that I play, um, is, How do you learn to improvise, which is a really tricky thing to teach. The first false assumption about improvisation is that something you have to learn. You learn to improvise. Well, that's such a funny idea to me because everything is improvised. Our interaction is, an, is a re response, you know, it's an, it's an improvisation to me. And um, even insects <laughs> interact, it looks like an improvisation to me. It looks like, well, this insect is doing this, this bug is doing this, and this bug is doing that, and that bug does this in response, and that bug does that. To me, it's, it looks like an improvisation to me. Not that they're performing, but just how we act and interact. And that's basically what, you know, on the most fundamental level, an, an improvisation is. And so to get down to what is the most basic, what are the essences that... Um, we develop in jazz improvisation, like harmony, form, rhythm, uh, style. Um, so I broke these things down and it took years. Um, uh, my first realization about this is that I was playing with my, with my trio and I had to take a break because I was being featured uh, in the uh, Chamber Music Society of St. Louis. Um, and this was a very good, uh, program because it involved their orchestra and the best players there. And I was going to be a soloist on a couple pieces. And so I had to really dedicate three months of my time to really get to that level of, of, of fo that focus level. And I came back and I did this piece called Hot Sonata by Erwin Schulhoff. Um, and he was 1930 was the piece, 1931, 30, 31. And it was in Berlin, and it was a jazz uh, piece, but it wasn't swing, which really was, by that time in the States, the States were into swing. It was really more of a hot jazz style, which is more of the 20s. And what I discovered from that <clears throat> is I came back to work in my trio, and we were doing a piece by Thelonious Monk and called Brilliant Corners. And it's a tricky piece because the bridge is only seven measures long. And so you have to be really careful about keeping track of your form because normally it's an eight measure form on the bridge. And so, but it was so easy. We came back and it was just, it was better than we ever played. And we hadn't played together for three months. And I said, why is that? We're all stumped by it. And so I went back and was thinking about it. One of those things that happens, you just have to just unpack that. And um, I realized that I had been practicing this rhythm called Tresil which was the basis of everything in this piece called the hot sonata. And that that was, 
a fundamental rhythm in jazz. This is something I didn't know until I was studying this piece. And um, it comes from Africa. Uh, it's known as a cross beat. And it goes like this. Here's the beat. Bump, dump, tick, dump, dump. So you have two separate beats going on. And uh, it's the basis of a lot of Latin music. It's a basis of a lot of jazz. For example, music from Scott Joplin around the turn of the century, elite syncopations. That's a tresil. The habanera is a tresil. That's a tresil. Um, the Charleston is a tresil. Three, three, two. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. I'd say one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. And then you get into rock and roll, um, Hound Dog, uh, the bass line, Elvis Presley's hit, you know, bum, dum, dee, dum, dum, dee. that's a tresio. Come together, Beatles. Shum, dee, dee, bum, dum, step, dee, bum, dum, dee, bum, dum, come together. That is a tresio. And what's really interesting is if you were listening to the inauguration, Joe Biden's inauguration, 2020, oh, 21. Um, Lady Gaga was the soloist for the national anthem. And when they got to the bridge, uh, the national anthem in 3 4. Oh, who say, can you see? It's in 3 4. But you get to the bridge, it's just, and the rock is red, clear. It goes like that, right? She got to that part and it was, Dum da da gong dee dee. It turned into a four four with the tresil, and that was like, oh, that went, that flew by over everyone's head. They didn't even realize what she had done, and I went, wow, that is absolutely phenomenal, because the tresil is an African rhythm, and it's what is a huge basis of the syncopated style of jazz and Latin music. So I took this tresil, and then I said, okay, let's really dive into this tresil in a way that creates many, many, many variations of three notes within eight beats, three eighth notes, 51 possibilities of creating the, that with the tresil, which is the three, three, two, duck, 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 the three, three, two to create form. And that's when I realized that form is not harmony, as we taught, it's about duration. And so that was an essence of jazz because jazz is based on a two measure phrase and it's, it's heavily influenced by these cross beats of African music, of the Tosin. So that's an essence of jazz. And so how do I dive into that and expand it in a way that does not permit uh, a compulsive technique to form because it's done over and over and over again. There's so many variations on it. Uh, the same is true with harmony. The same is true with just crossbeat rhythms um, of multiple uh, meters over each other. That can be really complicated. There's one exercise that's 567 subdivisions. Um, and it took me years to figure out how to just get through it without collapsing because you just, you, you fold, you, you just simply make a mistake, it falls apart, and then you have to go figure out, well, what's going on here? And so, uh, so the idea is to have a kind of open ending problem solving that avoids this perfection of one idea. And that was one of the major ideas. Then adding movement, all the exercises that I, create, I did with my voice before the horn. Um, and so that's how I approach developing how to improvise through these essences of the improvisation, but doing it in so many variations that it doesn't become one way of doing it. Like the, the way we used to teach is you learn these patterns and then you learn to play these patterns on these songs. And then by some up <laughs> osmosis, you'll figure out how to not just play the pattern, but that's how people play and it's, it becomes very predictable. And so I don't think it's really an effective way to learn to improvise. So, um, so that's basically, in a nutshell, what I do, uh, have worked on. And uh, so I think this would be a good time to ask a question. Or do you have any questions? Let me stop sharing so I can see.
you have any questions on and so the idea is how do we how do we go past our compulsive habits and how do we avoid the compulsive habits when we're learning something like music that takes thousands of hours to to learn without being compulsive so mm. questions that i could expand on or make clear usually what what we do is take <clears throat> what uh what our reflector gives us and just see what it means to us and yeah what you know how we can use that and i was thinking about it in terms of teaching therapists and uh the habit in focusing oriented therapy of reflecting uh what the what the client is saying and how do we um how do we teach that without it becoming a habit um there's a wonderful video uh on my video channel of um and the FOT video channel of uh Gene Genlin trying to break his habit uh or expand uh with someone who can't stand reflection and and the um uh, the video is called I Can't Stand Reflection. And so he automatically, habitually reflects what the client says. And here he can't do that and has to be more improvisational. It's one, wonderful to watch. Uh, but it raises the question about we want reflection to be instinctive rather than interpretation or uh guidance or something like that but we want it to be improvisational um so that that was where my mind went do do you have something to tell us about how something can be uh habitual in the sense of an instinctive and at the same time open and not mm -hmm. uh, wrote well, I, from my experience in music, which may relate, um, is that I think that, first of all, I'm not completely as familiar as what you would understand as reflection. So right. I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. But one of the things that uh, I find in music, it's a very competitive field uh, to be successful music. I mean, to get into the New York Philharmonic, uh, you don't have to play jazz to get into the New York Philharmonic. Um, and those players, they are going to be judged by any mistake they make. And so um, it's, there's a real, uh, what players do when they're playing an orchestra is they challenge themselves to do something other than what they're doing all the time. Mm. With chamber music, there was a cellist in uh, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra that joined a, a sub pop rock group as a chance to play, and even took a sabbatical from the orchestra to play in this kind of uh, totally different environment. And um, so a lot of players, uh, whether they're classical jazz, they're always they will look at something and say, I, I want to do that. And I want to do it in a way that's meaningful. It's not just a technique. Music isn't a technique. It's, it has, there are, it's nested into all these different feelings and perceptions. Uh, and, uh, and they're all related, of course, and probably talking to the choir here. Um, but it causes them to rethink about how they're doing because the the i think what people a lot of people don't realize i mean it's to hear the chicago symphony orchestra play is so exciting but for some of the players that play in the cso it's not exciting because they've been doing it for 30 years how many times are they going to play a beethoven symphony and not look and say oh we have to play beethoven symphony again this year i've done this so many times and there's a lot of sight reading people don't realize how 
much sight reading there is in an orchestra because they work up an entire program, evening of program every week. So they have to roll through those those rehearsals very quickly. They don't have time to immerse themselves. I had the luxury because I was a professor that I could take a piece and immerse myself into it for six months. You just can't do that when you're when you're making a living mm -hmm. as a performer. And so Steve, I see there's a, a hand up here. Yeah, I don't know if that makes any sense that they're looking for ways yes. to get out of what that. I got, yes, what I got from that is uh, that it's it's re really important to do something different always uh, yeah challenge yourself not to break the habit but to transcend the habit um and, and mm -hmm. decide, and yeah. music can be boring to right, right yes absolutely not to the listener but to the performers done this for yeah ten yeah it's boring so let, let's hear from yes. um uh, some of the group um the what people have to say what and and uh, we'll have about five minutes and then go into breakout rooms or or let's say mm -hmm. ten minutes mm -hmm. order mm -hmm. order after nine to nine uh nine thirty so let let's hear from people what uh we translate oh. this what this means yeah okay so uh, uh, uh uh, may a uh, pet uh, comment now or yes, yes. it's right yeah. hello uh, I can hear yeah okay uh -huh, okay so in fact um I mm, I wrote um an article about uh, um, some years ago uh, about improvisation, Feldenkrais, and focusing, uh, wow. and and gender's philosophy. In fact, uh, wow. And it it and uh, I'm yes. Uh, there is uh, so, but. What I, I uh, what I'm going to say now is is that um, I have uh, two definitions of improvisation, and and um, so w one is that it's improvisation, it's n or b <laughs> implied quality of interaction um, and uh, mm. another one another definition is improvisation is a, a, a trajectory of contact so what 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 i mean uh if if we take reflection as an as an example um, if i reflect everything that a person says it doesn't uh, it won't be meaningful and it won't be improvisational also and once uh, once uh, a colleague uh, 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 from from other field uh, uh, came came to my public session and I started with focusing as uh, to functional integration. She came and I started with focusing, and as soon as I reflected, uh, well, I did an interview first before the the session, and I, as soon as I reflected, <laughs> some phrase of her. She said, I know focusing, but I came not for focusing. And that that is an example of uh, of it of a reflection not working. Uh, and I think that what what I mean by uh, this definition of improvisation is a trajectory of contact or or um, 
um, uh, so uh, that I I only reflect when I hear that th this this phrase those words uh, carry something forward. Uh, carry uh, then I, I reflect it, and then it's it's. Uh, it's uh, it's an, uh, it's it's our joint mo moving forward and 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 then it's and then it feels like an an improvisation although i'm repeating it 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 feels like a jam session yes uh, yes yeah. thank you That's, yes that it, yeah. when it carries forward then it's improvisational. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? June is raising her hand, but I don't see everybody. Yes, hi. I just feel that the presentation was so rich and important that I would like to just reflect on it before my mind gets distracted and float away. Uh -huh. <laughs> um. so, so you would like June to reflect a little bit more before you said what was important to you? No, not me, mm. uh, per se. I, have, I don't want to say anything. I just want to reflect. I'm just saying I think it was so important and rich mm. that it would be nice if we could all reflect them, mm -hmm. in my mm. opinion. Yes. But I feel better just having said that, <laughs> that it was important and Rich, thank you very much. I feel better just having said that. So continue on as you wish. Right. <laughs> well, you gave us a pause there that was very helpful. Yeah, Monica. Um, thank you. So Steve, when you, you say everything is jazz, that that or everything is improvisation. Um, that's what I got from living with a jazz musician for, for 20 years, who's now in his late eighties. Um, the way he, I lived with his body and his, his way of interacting with people was so beautiful. Like being able to contact do you know, make that contact with, with his whole body and way of being. And he taught me how to, uh, the way I described it with, to myself was he taught me how to be nice and like how, just how to reach, how to reach people because I was brought up in England. Um, so I have the conservatory um, complex of not being able to reach and that, living with his body helped helped to open up because I could see that everything was jazz everything that he was doing with was jazz and being able to contact whoever anywhere you know uh that was why he was such a good friend and his uh friends were like that too um and like for an example like stopping when you're on the on the freeway and you stop to pay your toll, he would contact that person in the toll booth. Like that, that was a moment of improvisation and of jazz. Hey, how you doing? Who are you? Wow, this is great. You know, and, and that back and forth, the conversation mm -hmm. that one was able to have, which, which goes back to what Lynn said about, I can't stand reflection. You know, this woman is like, I want something of you. Give me you. Give me you, baby. Come on. Get this. Get it on. And 
you know, that sounds like Al right now. Let's get it on. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Yes, to that. Monica. yes. Yeah. it's inspiring. Yeah. Um, I have something else. Uh, I mean, um, if I may, because it was a pause that I'm breaking now. Um, um, yeah. For, for, uh, for, for, uh, well, one of, yes, and in, indeed, one of the points that I, I, I was making in that article is, is that um, even, even a person who is playing shit music is improvising or, or can or should be improvising. Uh, and, and I, I called it uh, performance improvisation. So, but uh, um, it, it was also important and it has been important to me also, but I, I, I didn't uh, figure out as, as you did uh, how to deal with that, that um, um, to, when uh, to, to to me the t timing is 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 very important that that makes uh, that is makes music uh, alive or makes it dead and uh, and it's so 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 quote unquote hard to to be in that timing to 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 play um, to play really um, as as if improvising uh, well or improvising indeed, but if you even even play a melody uh, uh, well known one and. Uh, that you played hundreds of times or thousands, uh, you you can improvise it, and then and then it will be perfect. So improvisation also makes things perfect. Somehow, yes. actually, actually, uh, Gene Genlin makes the point that you're making in his paper. Uh, improv improvisation provides. You might be interested in in reading that, Steve, about uh, Jenlin's view of uh, even when you're um, playing the same thing that has been played billions of times, improvisation is when it's alive, when you're doing it from within. Yes. Does anybody else have yeah, I just I, what's coming to me is the creative spirit that whether it's through music or art or dance or focusing in therapy, it's a creative process. And there's something there that if it, it coming from, I guess, the soul, the gut, you know, the, 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 the place within that just um, moves you. Yeah. So that's what that's what's coming to me today, you know, that, and that that's when you can really I can really connect, you know, through that. It feels very authentic at that time. Yes, yes. You know, um, in improvisation, some people that improvise, it's very calculated. It's almost like executing. Mm. Because there are these patterns, you know, they'll play that over and over and over again. And they get to that tune and there's a certain harmonic progression and they, oh, I'm going to plug right in here. Mm -hmm. And many situations professionally, let's say you're the hired gun on someone's recording to play a saxophone solo and you've got 16 measures. 
that is going to be very crafted improvisation because you're recording and recording his time and they want to lay that down and you're out of there. And it's, you don't even play with the rhythm section. There is no interaction on many recordings where you hear improvisation. They've just got this all recorded and the soloist is in the booth by himself just playing something over it. So there's no interaction in that kind of improvisation. But in a live setting, it is a totally different situation. So, so to me, you know, when you are improvising, it's just one simple idea and the what follows it. You know, ba dee ba ba dee da ba dee da da ba da ba dee ba dee ba da ba da ba dee dee ba dee dee da. So this constant, you know, one idea leads automatically to another and you don't have to worry about it. You're like a cat that's going to land on his feet. So how do you land on your feet? How do you feel comfortable enough that you know where the harmony is? You know where all these cross beats are. You've done all of your homework, thousands and thousands of hours, so that you're present. Getting you the paint. <laughs> huh? <laughs> so, so how do you get present with the situation so that you hear a drum? Sometimes you're not even aware of what's going on until the drummer comes and says, man, I just love that, what you were doing. And you didn't even realize because you were not even listening to the drummer, but you were reacting to the drummer, but some wasn't in your foreground of your consciousness. And, um, uh, but boom, you slap down the music in front of somebody and they're reading the, the progressions, the harmony, and that just goes right out the window. Because now they're just executing on their instrument what the correct changes, what we call changes, what the correct harmony is, and how to flow from there to there to there. Now suddenly it becomes in a page is in front of you. Instead of, okay, I know what all this harmony is, Forget it, let it go, because I'm confident I'm going to be within that form. Yeah. And I'm not going to mess up on the form if I don't. Art Tatum, famous jazz pianist, said, the, the interesting thing about uh, playing jazz is getting lost and finding your way back. Mm. And so, you know, we mm. assume, you assume when you listen to these players, they always know what they're doing. But a lot of times they're lost and they're just, you know, as one, one I uh, did this, Schuler Concerto and uh, Carl Roscott was the conductor, brilliant uh, conductor. And he said, you know, there's a fine line between a brilliant performance and just trying to save your ass. <laughs> and so it's that writing on that edge. It's like writing on, are we going to take off with this? Are we going to play it safe? Are we going to do something that's, you know, you're in a setting that, that there's no audience and they're, they're asking you to, play in a restaurant or they're, you know, you, all the playing situations are not ideal to being creative. And so how far are we taking this? You know, well, inevitably, if you're in a setting that doesn't embrace the idea that you're going to be creative, someone's going to come up and complain. They're going to say, stop doing that. It's not, I don't want to hear that. I'm trying to eat. Or huh. I, I remember um, one, it was at a hotel convention in Chicago, the Hilton. And they set us up this group that was a really good group and the group was just playing wonderfully. And we we're just background for this, where the exhibit hall was. And the guy came up that was monitoring this whole thing. He says, you guys are playing too loud. And of course the guitar player says, well, inevitably when you really start getting into it, someone's going to complain you're playing too loud. And so we played softer. I said, no problem. When someone's paying, you say, no problem. We'll do that. So we played softer. And he came up, he says, no, you're too loud still. So we played softer and we kept getting softer and softer and softer. And pretty soon it was so soft. You could speak quietly over the entire band. And so, he's, and he came up to me again and he said, it's too loud. And so I leaned over to him and whispered, I don't think we can play any softer than what I'm whispering to you. <laughs> and, and he laughed because he realized the only level left was for us to stop playing that he really didn't want the group at all anyway <laughs> so it depends on what situation you are that you're able to do what you want to do and that because of that commercialism that because of the professional level is that you're not paid to be creative you're paid to produce what the people want so if you are fortunate enough to be in a creative environment then you get to do what you want to do. And that takes you know, a kind of, of following that kind of audience that will come to listen and pay for you to play. Yes.
That's true. So in all these elements, that we assume that the musicians are creative, but 90% of the time we do what we're told. Right, right. And that's it's that's not, true. Not always yeah. fun. That's true in psychotherapy also when you're listening to the insurance companies. Which yes. It's a horrible situation. Okay. We only have. Liz raised her hand. Ten minutes. What, what's that, Jim? Liz is raising her hand. Ah, good. Liz. Should, we, should I save it for uh, late, late? Should I just. Well, um, if you want to have the breakout rooms. We, yeah, maybe I should save it if we're going to have the breakout rooms. Um, what What do you say, people? Do you want to have the breakout rooms? The 10 yeah. minutes? Yeah. Okay. So we'll have breakout rooms for 10 minutes and we'll be back at 9.35. People have lots to say, Steve. <laughs> back, buddy. We were just talking about standard tunes and limitations that you go into where you have this very conservative tune. Then how do you do something very spontaneous with that? That's free. Uh -huh. Very, very good question. Very standard structure of a tune that's been played for almost a hundred years now because it's Steve a is continuing a wonderful breakout com room conversation that I had uh, with him and Dorothy. Uh, and I was asking a question about um, that, that if I could just say what we were talking about. Um, Steve um, is, has been talking about improvisation and freedom. And I brought up the point that a lot of, of jazz music has the underlying melody and harmonic structure that's really coming from pretty conservative conventional tunes from from old Broadway shows, Gershwin, Irving Berlin. It's it's really not radical under there, right? So I pointed out that something about interaction, which we talk about a lot in focusing, that it's not just about this free improvisation, it's doing something with something that's pretty conservative that's your basis yeah. and that you have to relate to in some way yes yes yeah, and so like we we're almost getting to the point that you have this tune it has a form the form is very predictable even the harmonic movement is pretty predictable because these things i mean how do you know it's a broadway tune it has to have some similarities to other broadway tunes and so that is going on underneath but what's stratified above it is what the musicians are doing. And so you may not even recognize that tune from what the player's doing, but yes. all the other players recognize what is being implied yes. beneath that. And, and what I was telling Liz in this breakout group is that all of those tunes, almost all of them, I can't think of one that is, no, there's one I can think of. Uh, those tunes are based on a two measure phrase. And if that phrase is internalized, truly internalized, then you can find all of these ways to substitute for the harmony. You can substitute for all kinds of things, but you're keeping track of the form through this duration. And um, when someone really internalizes that two measure phrase, but you'd be surprised how many musicians do not internalize that. If you're a contemporary classical saxophonist, you probably have not got a strong internal, you have not strongly internalized that because the music of the 20th century isn't written like that in classical music. It's written in all kinds of extended phrases. And so once that idea of the duration of a phrase and then a section, an eight measure section that repeats and then a new section in the bridge and then it repeats back again in the fourth section and that repeats over and over again, all of it, then the tune becomes it goes it just floats down to the background so you are just now playing with whatever you want to substitute that because any chord works as a substitution because they all have some kind of leading tone to whatever harmony might be there and yeah. so it's it's you have these large but numbered 
variables that you can work with. And, and this is the thing about improvisation. And I don't want to lecture because I know you want to talk. Yes, well, we only it's, have maybe three more minutes. So we it's, better it's, see what people okay. say. Okay, now I'm going to say this. It's based on simple ideas that are now just expanded on. But it's a basic idea that you're working with. And so that's what I meant to say with Liz. Liz, oh, yeah, you're there. It's some basic idea that you're putting on top and all, everyone else is now expanding on it. I, I also just wanted to say that, I, I mean, my knowledge of jazz is limited and I know there's very radical stuff, but the kind of classical jazz stuff I'm talking about, you don't start out wild. You start out listening to Bill Evans or something. You or, or, you know what, you start out with a basic song and that and that's familiar. And then you wind up there too. You go home again often, not always, but you go home. It's kind of like classical sonata form. You have the themes, then you have a development section that does all kinds of things. But you know what? You wind up at home again, feeling safe. And that's very much like psychotherapy. Yes, right? yes. <laughs> the, the two measures would be the client says something, the therapist says something, the client says something, and the therapist says something are the two measures. Yeah. Anybody else, just quickly, because we, we uh, are going to have Dorothy read our poem. I thought it said sex coach. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, Steve. There's a, there's a lot to learn here uh, for us. Well, thank you for having me. Going uh, beyond uh, habits and, and uh, improvisation in all kinds of things. So thank you very much. And this is a poem that you picked out, Steve? I'm sorry? It is. is uh, it's based, uh, I played a piece by Eleni Lilios uh, that we collaborated on called Veiled of Resonance. And in the, the movements um, are based on um, uh, this poem, or part of it, uh, and I'll pull this poem up. And I have to say, I didn't really, really study the poem except the section in the, and this is called uh, by Wallace Stevens. Ah, good. Okay, well, Dorothy is all prepared here. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, this is 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird, as you said, by Wallace Stevens. And I just want to make one comment. Um, because there's often in poetry words that, oh, what is that? What is that? <laughs> just, just the reference. I mean, it, it, it always with poetry, that's why I like to put the name of the poem that you could look it up afterwards, which is in the chat. But this one word of, oh, thin men of Haddam, I had no idea, I thought it was some biblical reference. Um, it's actually the town where um, Wallace Stevens lived um, till the end of his life. So he he's makes a reference there. Okay, one. Um, I, I was thinking I would name this stanzas. It's just something about it. That, one, among 20 snowy mountains, the only moving thing was the eye of the blackbird. Two, I was of three minds like a tree in which there are three blackbirds. Three, the blackbird whirled in the autumn winds. It was a small part of the pantomime. Four, a man and a woman are one. A man and a woman and a blackbird are one. Five, <laughs> I do not know which to prefer the beauty of inflections or the beauty of innuendos, the blackbird whistling or just after. 
<laughs> Icicles filled the long window with barbaric glass, the shadow of the blackbird. The shadow of the blackbird crossed it to and fro. The mood traced in the shadow an indecipherable cause. Seven. O oh, thin maid of Haddam, why do you imagine golden birds? Do you not see how the blackbird walks around the feet of the woman about you? Eight. I know noble accents and lucid, inescapable rhythms, but I know too that the blackbird is involved in what I know. Nine. When the blackbird flew out of sight, it marked the edge of one of many circles. 10. At the sight of blackbirds flying in a green light, even the boards of euphony, euphony would cry out sharply. 11. He rode over Connecticut in a glass coach. Once a fear pierced him in that he mistook the shadow of his equipage for blackbirds. 12. The river is moving. The blackbird must be flying. 13. It was evening all afternoon. It was snowing and it was going to snow. The blackbird sat in the cedar limbs. <laughs> now, if you want, I'll share my screen and the sound of the piece that was written for me that's largely improvised on mm -hmm. Caulfield Resonance. I'm not sure we have time, but why don't uh, the people who have to go to work or whatever, mm -hmm. um, this would be a time to, to go and uh, any anybody that can stay, I'd love to hear it and maybe others would be able to stay to hear it. Okay. I'll play this piece right here. This is movement two, the blackbird whistling or just after. Wow.
That's it. There's one simple hearing hack anyone can use. Very, very much. All of those electronic um, sounds IQ off of a MIDI pedal. So none of the sounds are there are on a score that's pre-recorded. Wow. Many, many sounds. And the catch of that was if I hit the wrong pedal, the piece crashed. So I could not make a mistake. So it added a little edge to that performance. (laughs) <laughs> you couldn't make a mistake and you're improvising on top of it so oh thank you so much that was quite an experience and, uh that will be on our youtube channel along with this um yeah i can i can send you the links there's three movements great. That was, thank you very was... much okay people All right. well, thank you steve that was really fun